Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Mordell. Welcome to our digital breakfast session, When Trust Falters, Envisioning Corporate Strategies for the Next Normal. This is a great kickoff to this annual meeting, and we're really glad that you could all join us. And um, we hope that those um, who will be listening uh, on the follow-up uh, recording, that you can enjoy it just as thoroughly as well. So thank you. I come from a background with the Young Presidents Organization known as YPO, and um, we have over 30,000 CEOs in 140 countries. And with that background, we've seen all kinds of leadership challenges, certainly over the last year. And we've assembled a phenomenal panel here for you to take some insights relative to how to succeed in this next normal. And I'm going to briefly introduce them, uh, just very briefly. We want to get into the content as quickly as we can. So if you want to research them thoroughly in the, in the Harass Us meeting materials or otherwise, please do. I know they're open to your reach outs and um, hopefully learning more as time goes. So first of all, we've got um, Rich Sobel, who's managing partner of Alta, Altai Capital, and um, he's um, helped create and manage some of the largest private investment uh, platforms in Russia and e in Eastern Europe. And uh, quite an impressive background. the insurance industries, banks, and collaborations, and so comes with a wonderful perspective across all of that, because we're all woven together through finances, ultimately, of course, right, as that goes. And uh, Dr. Christopher um, Abraham, Professor Christopher Abraham, um, CEO at the F.P. Jane School of Global Management, based in Dubai. He's got plenty of insights um, into leadership and think uh, design thinking as well as organizational behavior and, and neuroscience and how that weaves into our leadership approach is quite important to him. Carolyn Buckloose um, is also managing partner of Imaginal Labs and acting man managing partner for the Center for Talent and Innovation. Very interesting. She's been helping individuals as well as organizations um, really strive to reach the greatest potentials. And so she covers a whole range of uh, approaches, both individuals and, and organizations. And then Paul Hodges, chairman of New Normal Consulting and publisher of New Normal Insight and the PH Report. He's based in Europe and currently in Spain, I believe, and uh, just comes with a wealth of information coming in from uh, the technical industry. So we have a fantastic panel here, folks, and they come with different perspectives. And um, we'll talk about how trust weaves into all of these different perspectives and, and how you can maximize your performance as that would go. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is start really with the beginning, because before we can address the envisioning corporate strategies for the next normal, we need a little bit of assessment as to what is that next normal? What's it going to look like? And so so with that, um, what is the situation from from your perspective, uh, Paul, as, as you would see that as you would go? How would you how would you assess the current situation as, we, as we're looking at the next normal? Well, I think, um, Scott, we've seen uh, over the past year uh, a quite dramatic change. If, if we had this panel a year ago, of course, we nearly had a harassment panel uh, where I am in Qashqais in Portugal, um, but it had to be cancelled, of course, because of the lockdown. Uh, I, I think there would have been two schools of thought. Uh, there would have been people who said, look, we've got to um, really focus on the health issues. The economy is going to have a bad hit. So all this talk about the environment and climate change and so on is very important, but we just need to prioritise here and now. And then we'd have had the other group of people who said, no, 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 we actually have to move forward. And uh, you know, the great thing about hindsight is that you can see that the people who said we have to look forward you know, came out on top. Uh, and there's no real discussion about that now. Uh, particularly, I think, important, uh, the Deputy Mayor of Milan uh, in April last year put it, I thought, very well, saying things that are happening today, we thought would be happening in 2030. And so, you know, we've really fast forwarded, which is always the way with, with transitions. Uh, I worked for a, a, a while, 20 years ago, in the dot-com industry. And, uh, you know, I, I learned uh, the, 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 the bridge, if, if you like, where you're coming along like this, and nobody quite knows what it is you can do for them. And on the other hand, you've no idea how to really operate in this new world. And then one morning, suddenly all that becomes clear. And you go up 
very fast. There, you, you, you hit uh, the tipping point and you jump that, that chasm of mutual misunderstanding. And I think that's really what's happened today. So you know, to get into detail uh, with, with your question, Scott, uh, what we, we see six areas really having major change. One is in demand patterns. And we can't be sure about how demand patterns will change, but it's pretty clear, I think, that areas like travel, uh, uh, office working, uh, leisure, and so on, have been radically changed uh, over the past year. Secondly, uh, I think that uh, energy has, been, has changed. We've started to see an enormous focus now on uh, energy abundance, and you can see that um, you know, uh, uh, OPEC is, is playing the usual silly games on, on oil, but in the real world, uh, we're now moving to a world of renewables, which are very, very cheap. I mean, here in Portugal, uh, for example, we signed up for solar uh, last order at, uh, at le less than $10 um, a megawatt hour. So far cheaper, the economic of renewables are now coming through. I think in last time we uh, we've seen problems, a lot, a lot of problems, with pharmaceutical manufacturing. Why is that? Because they're still using 100-year-old batch technology, and they should be moving now to modern, continuous, bio-enabled, uh, digital-enabled technology. Uh, and that's, a, that's something that's going to have to be addressed. Reshoring, I think, is going to be a more immensely part, important part of the world. Um, you know, you, you can't open the papers today or, or, or look, look, look at Facebook or anything without seeing uh, major supply glitches. Uh, car firms now shutting factories because they can't get simple things like $2 semiconductors. So re re really global supply chains are, 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 are out, of, out of the way. The circular economy is obviously the answer to this. We don't need global supply chains anymore. We need to go back to a local to local. We need to stop. Um, wasting enormous resources and throwing things away, particularly plastic. So, and then the final uh, area of, uh, of, of, of change is I think we've moved on from the idea of work-life balance and how do we do that to a question of where and how do we work. And then if I just come back to this question of, of, of trust and so on, one of the key reasons for trust is we know the direction of travel now in these six areas, and I'm sure my, my colleagues have got other areas as well, but we don't know where we're going to end up. And we have to get trust in place, because otherwise, I say to you, Scott, why are you doing that? And you say, well, I think I'm doing it. Oh, no, 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 no. We've got to change that adversarial uh, relationship and become much more trusting. But uh, given that none of us can quite know, I rather like Kissinger's point of trust but verify. Okay, I think that's a good idea, Scott, but just explain it to me a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I'd like to um, uh, bring it over to Suzanne, if, if we might, just relative to trust, of course, has underlied financial services uh, literally since the beginning of time in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and I'm just curious what, uh, what you think, um, what are the key circumstances of trust as it relates uh, to, um, uh, to the next normal from your perspective? Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, absolutely. Trust is uh, basic for uh, financial service. If you don't have it, you're not in uh, business. Uh, so that's it. So I'm, I'm both being in, in the financial service or the banks uh, and uh, the fintechs and in between. So uh, each of them, they... Uh, they uh, they can benefit from each other. The one is agile and uh, going uh, forward, and uh, with the digitalization, uh -huh. banks uh, they some of them are dragging their feet, uh, and uh, they are some forced uh, with the regulation and getting open banking and so forth. But what we really see is the digitalization for corporations and merchants uh, in particular in these uh, times. So the <clears throat> pandemic uh, has uh, forced it uh, in a good way. So we are we are uh, skipping a lot of years uh, going uh, straight uh, into it because uh, if you're gonna sell something, <laughs> you need to have it digital. Otherwise, uh, you don't get the payment, uh, you don't get the customers, and and so forth. And of course, the merchants they want to sell their goods, and uh, hence they have to be uh, digital one way or, or the other. Uh, so that's a that's a good one. Uh, and now in the soft lockdown or a co completely lockdown, the click and get uh, is is a good way to get forward. And this is uh, also helping uh, the banks uh, keeping their customers happy and uh, driving uh, to it. 
onboarding, payments, logistics, and all those uh, things uh, is, of course, uh, key uh, to, to them. And uh, if you don't have these things, you don't have the trust uh, part uh, of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you get into the cybersecurity, which is another uh, another uh, ball game that we all need to get at. And that brings me to uh, the financial service, uh, meaning the banks, insurance and so forth, and the executive committee. What is the knowledge, the understanding, the experience in digitalization, uh, uh, cybersecurity and so forth? Uh, to make sure that uh, the competence uh, is there. Everything needs to be fast, uh, fact-based uh, and uh, uh, info, and then uh, you need uh, the, the data to do so. And I think that's also the core that uh, we are relying on, uh, fruitful data to mm -hmm. analyze that and then go forward. Mm -hmm. So those, those are my uh, first uh, experiences uh, in, in uh, the financial services in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. And, uh, and, and Rich, you spend really a lot of domain space uh, perspective uh, coming from Eastern Europe and Russia and uh, just a lot of trends as, as that would go. While this is an American conference, it's a global audience. We, we, we do business across and, and uh, I know that there's lessons to be learned, um, just what you're seeing. So um, anything you'd like to share relative to kind of situation assessment? Yeah, I think the experience of my time in the former Soviet Union and then quickly Russia and the countries in the region, it's very interesting since the early 1990s. And it's informative about that region, but about most emerging markets. So in the early days, when companies were privatized, there was a grab for assets, and there was a very low level of trust in the governments, in the markets, and people fought over assets, and they grabbed what they could, and they monetized what they could. And over time, markets opened up and companies had to compete both locally and across borders. And so the old ways of doing things required modernization, restructuring and investment. And to do that, managers and owners had to game up. In order to do that, they had to show more transparency. They had to attract management teams. They did the first like 1.0 of what you would say to do trust. Um, and over time, the capital markets developed. And companies that were interested in accessing the capital markets had to do even more. And, you know, my experience in the 90s and the 2000s investing in private companies, what was a key criteria for us was finding owners with whom we could establish a trusting relationship. They didn't always agree to do what we asked them to do, but they had to agree to always be open to communication and transparency. And that was a successful formula. Didn't always work. Sometimes people were stubborn, but on balance, we did quite well with that. In recent years, I've been on the board of Cherkizov, the largest meat company in the region. And that's been a different story. It's been a company that's closely owned by a family. It goes back 45 years, and the company has gone through several rounds of modernization. The stock is a publicly traded stock, and until recently, it was very depressed. And they brought in a new manager who had experience from Procter & Gamble and Heinz, and he undertook what you would say is kind of a master class in introducing transparency, honesty, pay for performance, firing underperformers, bringing the management team together to establish collaboration around a shared plan and accountability. And what's happened is the performance has sharply increased and the stock price has gone up. You know, in, in a company that's a large meat producer, you have to have trust with your customers, your suppliers, your retailers, but most of all with your employees. And what he was able to do that the family that owns the company wasn't able to do was he was able to essentially work hard, change the culture, but also show some vulnerability so that the employees would feel some trust. And in order to innovate and take risks, you have to have trust. And so it's been a very interesting experience. I think, unfortunately, the trust in the markets still puts downward pressure on stock values. But this pattern has uh, helped me to believe in the globalization. And I would just say one last thing is that companies, no matter where you are, 
the myth that you can hide, that your geography or your segment isn't really going to be affected is not the case. So, um, you know, I'm generally a, a believer in closing, I would say, is that building trust is at the core of any virtuous cycle that a management team wants to employ. I don't hear you. You are on mute. Oh, sorry, thank you. Very well said. Um, and uh, um, uh, broad perspectives coming across. And, and I know Carolyn's got um, uh, quite a quite a human approach because a lot of times in business we're saying authenticity and trust in these things. And uh, um, and I think uh, moving into a little bit more, maybe for all of us, uh, a little bit more granularity as, as, as to how, how this uh, translates. So, so Carolyn, um, what, what do you what do you foresee relative to the situation assessment from from the people side um, uh, from your standpoint? Yes. So we, there has been a seismic change in the last year uh, for two reasons. One, uh, because of the pandemic and because of the different institutional responses that are non-standardized and all over the place, the risk of decision making has actually now gone to the individual. What is safe? What can I do? What should I do? without any institutional guidance that is standardized. So that is the impact of the pandemic is in fact, uh, for everyone around the world, the individual as head of household is now the decider for what's safe and what isn't. What's safe for them, what's safe for their kids, what's safe for their spouse, including who do you work with, who do you visit, how do you work? How do you live? How do you love? Uh, that on top of the fact that there is no corner office anymore. We all have the same corner. And so the authority of whose idea is a good one and who owns the risk has dramatically shifted. And I don't, we're never going to go back to the power structure of the hierarchy in terms of who makes the decisions that is the right decision for the individual. So that's the, that's the big seismic shift. Now the opportunity is without a corner office or the fact that each of us has the same corner, it looks exactly the same, mine might have a little bit more color, is we now are can um, we've democratized, we've created the condition to democratize ideas because idea can come from any corner now. Mm -hmm. And that's really the huge opportunity. Uh, if companies know that this shift has happened in terms of relationship with authority and that's where the trust building needs to come. Well, wow, makes uh, makes great great sense. So, wh why don't we shift as a group? And uh, once uh, once uh, Christopher gets leveled in, we'll we'll get some feedback from from him as well. But uh, just a question, uh, really, as we make the shift, just hear everybody speaking to um, uh, really trust and being more authentic and and everything else. And those are good human qualities that probably a lot of people are striving to become uh, in, in their in their regular life, if you will. But here we are in business, which is the highest of all callings, right? I mean, business pays for everything on the globe when, when you think about it, business and commerce ultimately. And all of our participation in business in some way is, is, is part of weaving all of these societies together. So um, let's get more specific uh, if we can. Uh, and, and I, I want to go, go back to Suzanne if I, if I can. So what advice do, do you have for somebody? Like how do... What, what should they be doing now that maybe they weren't doing a year ago uh, that, that may, may make them more effective in, in some of these uh, trust, uh, trust strategies, if you will? I would say, uh, uh, on, on uh, what Caroline was saying, uh, seize the moment, uh, seize the opportunity, mm -hmm. seize the time. What can you utilize as uh, your, you have your asset, uh, you usually know those uh, pretty well, but uh, how, what, what is the future looking like? And uh, uh, building on the digitalization, how do you build uh, a digital uh, product uh, into the market? So how do you keep the global uh, market arena? What we see with the fintechs is that they see much more opportunity in the global space uh, compared to the, I would say, the regional banks because they kind of stick to their borders and not going on there. <clears throat> 
we did it all with the super duper technology and fantastic product but it's all about the people uh, being able to sell their products and then uh, connect uh, with uh, other countries other regions and and uh, so forth and from from the yeah uh, very open and transparent society that we have here in in the nordic uh, uh, we easily can get uh, all over the world uh, once we uh, start uh, aiming for it so uh, i'm saying seize the moment and uh, go for the opportunity that uh, you have in front of you thank you thank you, thank you very much and uh, and come back to rich uh, a bit because uh, building trust has been the foundation of all sorts of things but in terms of what uh, what tactics uh, you know especially now that we're digital as opposed to being in person um, just uh, what what tactics or advice would would you have for somebody to to really uh, build that trust and authenticity i think that in any situation the trust begins with opening up the lines of communication. And as much as you can tolerate, open them up. Don't open them up in silos and separate channels. Don't have different messages in different directions, but really make the organization and the communications flat and consistent. The um, the, the way organizations uh, really come together is by everybody having the same message, everybody having the same goals, everybody feeling like the rules of the game are similar and that when there are conflicts, they're enforced in a consistent way. Conflict is real. When you pull back the screens and you say to people, you know, you want more, it's okay to take some risk. I mean, you're naturally going to have some issues that need to be adjudicated. How you adjudicate them is critical to the kind of culture you create. And so, you know, the virtuous cycle that I was referring to before, it starts by prudent chances. So if you want to have a successful company that's really moving forward, that's not stagnant, you have to create trust and confidence and eliminate the fear. And it starts by the leader actually walking the walk. So you can say it, but if there's a disconnect between the stated intentions and the way they actually play out, people are going to watch what they do, not what they say. So lead by example. Really, really great stuff. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, when Paul and I were, were, were talking, um, I was struck because most of my experience has been in the um, uh, SME space and, and, and Paul's playing at these massive organization kind, kind of structures uh, as it goes. And so, uh, Paul, I'm curious what you might add for in terms of uh, advice and, and, and perspective for, for leaders and executives relative to trust, because uh, those, those are giant infrastructures. I, I to build on but the, the points that have been made, which I think are very good. When, when we do workshops, I'm re reminded while Rich was talking, uh, we, we did a workshop with a very large company in, in Austria, uh, headed up by an American uh, lady. And um, unusually, we did a workshop on a, on a Friday afternoon, which you don't normally want to do because people are a bit tired until the end of the week. But it was, it was a good, it was a very good workshop. And then we did a follow-up workshop sort of a few days later and uh, when, she, when she came in, she said, you know, I was just really fired up by that workshop. And I went home and I told my teenage daughter all about it. And my daughter said, oh, I'm glad you've caught up, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> and I had that experience several times that, uh, and, you know, Rich's point really, uh, really resonated uh, with me. Because I, I think that one of the issues is that we compartmentalise work and home and so we have these discussions about climate change about violence to women about what you know, all these all these topics at home and with our friends and so on and then we go into the the office you know even if we're not going to the office today we're going into uh, zoom calls and so on and, and we don't get into those issues we continue to talk about the way the world should be as the office used to be and so on and uh, and I think that that is the biggest challenge that we've got at the moment. I was going to say that the, the, the exper experience of Russia is perhaps an extreme version of what we're all going through in the West. We know that Russia has those problems, you know, but we don't associate themselves uh, ourselves in the West with that. But I think that's exactly uh, where, where we are. And uh, uh, this concept of leaders talking 
about something and initiatives has become very devalued in the West. Mm-hmm. But every CEO has, a, has an initiative. And you go, oh, yes, it's an initiative. But you know he doesn't really mean to do it because he, his most important thing is that the stock price has to keep going up. Mm-hmm. So there's a conflict between doing what is right and doing the stock price, what we know, mm. you know. And so you've got widespread cynicism in this area. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I think that is, you know, that's really where trust comes in. And that, that isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to take quite some time for leaders to accept that people aren't necessarily going to take at face value about what, what they're saying. Thank you, Paul. Uh, a very, very astute. And I just want to do a call out and see if we can't hear from Christopher. Christopher, are you in, like, dialed in? No, that's unfortunate. Uh, technology can is a is a is a great uh, propeller of our societies, but sometimes a little bit of a hindrance. So uh, apologies uh, for that as it would go. I want to uh, ask a uh, open question, just relative to uh, um, you, you. You all see and experience so much. I'm I'm wondering. Um, we all need some role models in our lives, right? In, in terms of uh, <laughs> people who, um, hey, th- I, I just need to do more of what she is doing or I need to do more of that, or, or this person really has it going well, or this organization really just seems to be on, on a really good trajectory. Um, it, it just, I want to open it up to anybody where, where some of these might come up, come along uh, toward some thoughts. If you have some good role models that we can leave uh, with, with folks. Uh, Carolyn, please. Um, I want to actually create a different frame, if I could. Okay. Scott, which is, um, what is the role model of the future? Meaning, um, how do we know that leaders are also good ancestors? That they are, they have a legacy mindset uh, that isn't around stock price, but they have a legacy mindset about what are they doing that works for current and future customers, stakeholders, employees, etc. And there's. Um, the, we have not really focused on the real innovation engine. You know, most companies are still product centric as a, uh, and a lot of the focus is on the discovery development and life cycle management of the best products, as opposed to recognizing that it's really about the life discovery development and life cycle management of the most innovative people. And the consequence of that is the best product. So what I'd like to give you are a couple traits of what the role model of the future looks like, because we should be hiring leaders who have these attributes, which is they need to be able to thrive in chaos, not survive in chaos, but actually thrive with chaos, where they really know how to embrace and equip teams for uncertain futures. They need to be culturally fluent, culturally centric, where where culture really is the focus of what their work is. Um, they need to know how to disrupt bias. There is so much old thinking in the system, and whether it's bias relative to your judgment of what a leader looks like, acts like, and behaves like, or bias relative to this is just the way it is, and they need to be paradigm shifters. They really, they need to be shape shifters because we are really, this new normal is like nothing we've ever seen. The future is really calling us to step into challenging all the unchallenged assumptions that we've been living with for 50 or 60 years. Um, and uh, so when I think of that role model for the future, um, we're probably going to need to go much younger <laughs> um, because there's a different way of thinking. Um, and to really open up uh, to the people who will lead in the next generation. Um, and uh, for uh, uh, a lot of us warriors to recognize our elder status <clears throat> because we are iterative thinkers. Mm. We're coming from what we know, and the patterns that are coming at us are so different. 
Thank you. Can I just ask you? Please, Do you think that they are different from where we were 30 or 40 years ago, uh, or were they different from where we've been for 20 years? Because when you were talking, which I entirely embraced, I remember when I, my company, I worked for a very large UK company uh, for 20 years, and they sent me to the States in the early uh, 1980s, an early part of globalization. And my well, senior boss, uh, director, uh, flew into Houston to see me and said, look, Paul, we have no idea what you're going to do here, but don't worry, you have a return ticket, and whatever you want to do between the Arctic and the Antarctic in North and South America, we will support you. And, and that, you know, people talk about empowerment, but that was a pretty empowering uh, thing. And, you know, within, within a year, I was doing $75 million worth of business because you couldn't really fail with that kind of, of, of attitude. So I, 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 but what I feel is that we've rather lost that, that spirit and that maybe what you're, what, you're, what you're saying part of it is we're going to go back to that world where the people who are on the ground know best and the job of the, you know, SAS used to have this idea that it was the inverted pyramid that when they were well, when they were successful, you know, the, the job of the management was actually to support the staff, not the other way around. Mm. Right. And that's just what I'll just say on that is uh, that's going to require what is going to be needed for the new normal is a real redistribution of power. Yeah, and on the, on that uh, note, uh, I very much liked uh, when you said uh, the younger uh, generation, uh, Carolyn, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm I'm working in in the midst of those two. Also, you have on the board, uh, which is uh, the grown ups, and then uh, with the fintechs, uh, more more the kids uh, part of it. And then, uh, if you put in financial inclusion on top of that, because then you get into the more value based uh, ESG, SDG, and and uh, so forth. And uh, using uh, one example, uh, Charlotte, uh, she's uh, founded and uh, heading uh, Jamie One, which is working in, in uh, Africa, uh, helping uh, um, women on the ground to uh, save money so then they can build up uh, business uh, for the neighbor and, and so forth. It's such an immense uh, thing what uh, she's uh, doing. And of course, she's so far away from uh, IPO and uh, stock exchange and, uh, and so forth. But she's so passionate about it. She's good with people. She has a fantastic business uh, sense. And she's out uh, there. So again, I think uh, the younger generation, they, uh, they have a different value set <laughs> that is not only driven by uh, IPO and uh, uh, unicorns and uh, stock uh, and, and so forth. So uh, over that time, you build uh, the basis and over time you will uh, make a, a sustainable business in financial, cultural uh, and uh, sustainability uh, part of it. So I think that's a good way to look at it. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Rich, some of this is resonating, I can tell by your expressions, so please. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would just like to echo that, you know, in the kind of second part or the tail end of this pandemic, I think many of us around the world have come to appreciate that there's a lot of things more important than money and that while making money is still an important priority for a lot of around purpose-led businesses with wonderful entrepreneurs, and it's not unique to Silicon Valley. In fact, it's widely distributed and it's mm. not just in software. It's using technology to go into traditionally state industries like ag tech and education. And um, we're watching and investing in a lot of things in this area. And it's a lot easier to establish trust and confidence and a flat organization and to include diversity, all things that are really the key to unlocking potential when you start with a small team and a blank piece of paper. And this is going to upend a lot of incumbents in big industries who are complacent. And oftentimes it's young folks, but those young folks are also looking to bring in older folks to bring some experience on the board or in key roles. There's a tremendous opportunity to make valuable companies but there's also this purpose thing that resonates for a lot of us. I, I feel uh, by the nods and by the comments of my uh, panel, pa common panelists, that this is very exciting. And so coming out of the pandemic with the economies getting back off, their, off the floor, there's going to be a tremendous 
explosion of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think it's something to, that all of us, people who are joining to listen to the panel, people who are investors, people who are in looking for their second or third careers can become involved mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Rich. It's it's quite interesting that um, even in YPO before the pandemic, uh, we had surveyed everybody and, and uh, we had more than 94 percent of our of our leaders said, you know, business is much more than just generating wealth. It, 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 it's 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 this broader impact and lay the the, the uh, disruption that comes and, and the focus that comes from a crisis. And, and, and I think all of the stakeholder management, all this focus that we're here to do different things is is um, it's just just really um, exciting accelerated and injected uh, relative to how, the, how that plays out. So with that, uh, we, we've got a few minutes left, and this is a digital breakfast uh, uh, flyby, really to kick off uh, much focus for the rest of uh, this uh, in, important conference. I'd love to give uh, anybody just a couple opening, closing minutes, if you will, if you'd like to comment on something we haven't touched to, or um, if there's uh, something you'd, you'd like to share bef before we break. Yeah, Carolyn, um, please. Yeah, I just want to build on, um, uh, on Rich's comments, which is, um, I am so excited about the future um, because anything is possible now and we have the opportunity to meet this moment and the, the role of companies now are really to be leadership academies uh, we are the most global we are the most the least parochial um, and the longest view, you know, we don't get elected every year. And our job is to create conditions for group genius. Uh, and the group genius now needs to include everyone mm -hmm. because um, we haven't. No. Uh, and uh, so when you think about technology and the fact that we can speak this way, well, actually the greatest untapped technology in the world are human beings who mm. love to solve problems. That's what makes us different. We're homo sapiens, the wise ones. We love to solve problems and boy, do we have problems to solve. Mm. Uh, so to employ, create conditions for group genius and do it around the world because now we can include everyone in our little corners is just amazing. And then uh, bringing in uh, collaboration, I think is, is the key element there. We see it with the fintechs and the being captured, <clears throat> this notion of big data and companies are using artificial intelligence to process this data and sometimes to make decision models around the data. And that's all very powerful as long as it doesn't completely displace or devalue the human role in all of this. So I would agree strongly with Carolyn. It should empower. It should do things that uh, you know we couldn't do before but it shouldn't come at the expense of dehumanizing these organizations and forgetting about the important role of the human capital development. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of stories uh, this, this morning in, in, in the media uh, where um, one has to be careful about the idea of artificial intelligence, which I, I don't think we're anywhere near at the moment. Um, a couple of examples of a um, 102 year old uh, who unfortunately died. Uh, what, 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 when they just, when they investigated records of COVID, they realised they'd been put down as this a two-year-old who had died because the mm. computer only took two 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 numbers instead of three, <laughs> and, uh, and it's a it's a it's a good example, I think, of we need to look at the computing world. I, I grew up with computers in, in work. We had some of the first computers and so on, but we also knew they weren't very good. And so as a business manager, one of the things I did every month when I got the point out was to look at it and do a sense check. And I actually knew what the number should be. And if the number wasn't right on the computer, it was the computer who was right. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember my company did a very big uh, acquisition, which I wasn't involved in. It was, large, it was the first time a UK company did a billion dollar acquisition in the States. And it, it never worked out properly. And after about 18 months or so, they went back and investigated the spreadsheet and discovered that somebody had put the wrong formula in. 
And, mm. you know, so it was, uh, which is a, a powerful learning to all of us, that the machine is only as good as the people you're, uh, who, are, who are working with it. And so I think... And th that brings in the, the bias. Uh, also, we can be biased as uh, people uh, talking to each other and we're leaning on our gut feeling and our experience, our data and so forth. But then to take the bias out of the data, uh, that is a key because uh, we are early, early, early uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. There's uh, tons of data out there. And if you put in <laughs> wrong formulas and uh, coders uh, is still very many uh, guys and the uh, guys have have their bias when they come in and code. Uh, so, so we need to, to spread. So we have all kinds of um, a diversity also into the coders uh, because uh, they are setting the norm uh, and we are taking the analysis of this, what is coming out of the uh, artificial intelligence and take over. Uh, yes, we will bring the gut feeling, which I think is a super duper artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think the, 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 the way I look at what you expect from a consultant to really, yeah. uh, is that there's a hierarchy really of data, information and understanding. And mm. you know, there's masses of data, uh, as, as Rich was saying, most of which is wrong, either mm. deliberately or, 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 or otherwise. It, you know, it, it can provide information about what's going to be the weather tomorrow, uh, but if you actually want mm. to understand the climate, you have to go into mm. a much bigger uh, kind of analysis. Mm. And you've got to be prepared to sort of make high assumptions and test them out uh, uh, mm. rather than, and we've seen this you know, in the poor performing countries over over the pandemic, uh, people who've taken a very simplistic, I was just Paul Nurse, mm. the uh, um, Nobel Prize winner, and he said one of, one of the biggest problems with the pandemic has been trying to reduce it to populist slogans, you know, wash your hands. Mm. That is not how you're going to solve this problem. Well said, well said. Well said. Uh, thank you, everybody. And and it's it's interesting that uh, um, you know sometimes we just dive in. It's th just the last uh, few minutes of comments have been very illuminating uh, for me uh, because uh, we talk a lot about a topic, especially in these business conferences, right? Like here's a strategy, and uh, or if you go someplace else, you say, well, let's let's really understand what love is. And it's like, what is trust really when we get down to it? And and and, and trust in many ways is is either the reduction or mitigation of what's inherently going to be fearful, right? And, and do you have value alignment? And, and uh, how, are we, how are we willing to collaborate and get, in, get involved uh, together? And, and uh, are we being valued as human beings as, as we show up or are we being devalued in whatever way that would be to us individually? So the converse of what our strategies need to be um, have to be ultimately reducing that sense of fear, but also um, being proactive about what, what brings the value alignment to bear, what brings the taking of risks and, and opportunities uh, um, uh, more overt, and finding ways among an organization to harness that uh, so mm -hmm. that we can accomplish much more as an organization than we ever could as individuals. And so some great little themes and takeaways. I hope somebody comes back and, and spend some time with the, this 45 minutes, but we're talking about seizing the moment, uh, building out your digital approaches because everything's uh, much more accelerated relative to that, addressing issues of fear and vulnerability and making it okay, both as individuals and within your organizations. Leading by example, the old walking the talk approach is, is really important, uh, even more so digitally about how you show that example as, as, as time goes. And not compartmentalizing, allowing our organizations to be flat or open so that so that people feel that, uh, that the fairness and everything else comes up, comes across from that. And then um, uh, Carolyn just had a had a really wonderful rant, which I know is not a rant. It's part of her, her thinking. It's very tight <laughs> and thriving on chaos and really, really embracing this this time in this moment and, and uh, being culturally fluent as we're all global organizations now. And uh, even um, we have cultures within our um, countries and, and in our organizations that we need to be mindful of. And uh, knowing how to disrupt the bias that's out there and, and, and sorting through that. And uh, let's just embrace this idea that we can change paradigms because that's uh, we're all there because power is more dispersed now. It's not just the person sitting in wherever that corner office is. It's really, it's, it powers everywhere and we should embrace that everybody. So so with that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. I wanna thank this panel. Uh, I We could go on for a much, much longer time and dig deeper, I know. But I just want to thank you for being willing to participate in this format, for sharing so openly as you have. And I look forward to uh, connecting and learning more from you as we go. So this will conclude our session. Be well, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done.